Welcome everybody. We are so grateful you're here with us today. My name is Emily Badix and I am the Associate Director at the Paul K. Longmore Institute on Disability at San Francisco State University. A quick um, audio description of myself. I'm a white woman in my late 30s. I'm sitting in front of my mantelpiece and um, just a few access notes and then we'll get it going. Um, if you use captions, uh, you can you can access captions directly here on Zoom um, or you can also um, access them on stream text if that's your preference. And that's tinyurl.com slash longmore captions. We'll uh, enter that into the chat as well. Um, you can use the Q&A space as if it's a conversational chat room as well. Um, and you can also use that space to ask your question for the panelists. I know that they will be excited to hear from uh, audience questions and, and not just um, our moderators questions today. Um, this event is part of a series that the Longmore Institute is doing on trying to talk about places where disability is underrepresented or that we maybe don't talk about the influence that disability expertise brings. So this is the second in our series. And um, a quick shout out, this series came about because we have this amazing group of Longmore student fellows who work with us. And um, we've done this program for about 10 years. And we've noticed over the years that the fellows are coming in the door just so much more uh, immersed in disability justice conversations already. Um, uh, so, you know, confident and developed in their identities in ways that wasn't always the case for college students. And when we ask why, they say that they've learned it from some of the um, folks who we're going to hear from today, um, having access to, to these voices from a really early age. Um, so in particular, this panel came about because we asked one of our fellows, uh, Nathan Burns, to think of like, who's your dream panel? And these folks were that dream panel. So um, dreams coming true today, uh, which is a pretty fun, fun thing to, to be part of. And uh, so with that, I will pass it over to our moderator, Sky, and just want to thank you all for being here with us and our panelists for all being a part of this. Thank you, Sky. Thank you so much. I'm just going to do a quick uh, audio description of myself and description of a little bit of what I do, and then I'll ask the uh, other panelists to do the same. I'm Sky Kabaku. And I use they, them, their, and they, them, their pronouns. I am a small Filipinx person. I have spiky triangle makeup under one eye and seafoam lips. I have a scale male headpiece in pink, purple, turquoise, and yellow. And I'm wearing a bodysuit that I, I, I made everything that I'm wearing. Uh, that features fabric in a lot of fun neons and jewel tones with some of my late father's paintings featured on them. I'm also wearing uh, queer crip symbol earrings, which feature the newer accessibility icon smashed with the trans symbol in neon pink plexiglass and lavender and pink chainmail necklace. I'm sitting in front of a geometric black and white patterned um, pillow. I am the creator of Rebirth Garments, which is a clothing line for queer and trans disabled folks of all sizes and ages. And um, yeah, I'll pass it to either of the panelists who want to give their description and talk a tiny bit about what they do. Want me to go first. Um, hi, I'm Eliza. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. Uh, visual description of me. Um, I have rainbow hair. I'm white. Um, I'm from the UK. I live in London. Um, and I'm wearing a, I'm going to say rainbow, rainbow um, set of dungarees and a pink top. Um, and I am sat on a leather chair and I've got a white wall behind me. Um, and I've got some eyeliner on as well and I've got tattoos all down my right arm of 
various different bugs and fruit. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's what I look like. Um, and I'm a disability content creator and educator online. Mainly my work is on Instagram, um, but I also do various different talks and things like that um, and work with various different brands talking about disability and um, trying to make disability education um, accessible for everyone and in kind of small bursts in places like social media and things like that. And Dev. Uh, I'm Dev. I use they, them pronouns or he, him, but mostly they, them in professional settings. Um, for my visual description, I am a light to medium brown skin person of Indo-Caribbean heritage um, in my late 20s. I have a blonde, like shortish, uh, wavy hair uh, styled in, uh, I call it a pompadour. I don't know if that's a correct description, um, but I like it. I'm wearing red over the ear headphones. I've got two facial piercings, one in my septum, one in my right nostril. I'm wearing a uh, hoodie that is covered with a stitch from Lilo and Stitch. Um, and I am in my bedroom in my apartment in Toronto, uh, but my background is all blurred. So you can only really see the bright uh, light that is streaming in from my windows. Um, and I am what you would call a multidisciplinary storyteller, I guess. Uh, I do, uh, I write uh, personal essays. I uh, also write fiction and poetry as well as uh, produce um, podcasts and short films and uh, also do audio engineering. And uh, I am also a facilitator with a collective called CRIP. Uh, that's C-R-I-P, and uh, yeah, we, we do workshops on uh, ableism and disability justice, um, and we recently expanded to be a, a group of six of us, uh, so I facilitate with uh, Kate Welsh, um, Kitty Roday, uh, Kay Nathaniel, Salima Punjani, Janelle Anderson and our newest member is Midnight, uh, who goes by first name only. And I think that pretty much covers it for me and the thought. Awesome. This is Sky speaking. Uh, I would love to hear any of your favorite current projects that, that each of you are doing. Uh, for me right now, I've been working with the Chicago Public Library the past couple of years on a queer DIY uh, teen focused fashion curriculum. So I'll put in the chat the playlist that's on YouTube. We have over 85 videos so far on all sorts of uh, DIY fashion and body adornment. Um, so that's my favorite project I'm working on right now. Um, and yeah, either of you, who ch do you, would you prefer me to call you out or do you want to just, okay, uh, uh, <laughs> Eliza. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, it's Eliza speaking. Um, for me, I don't necessarily have any kind of set projects um, that I'm working on that, um, you know, it really kind of in works, but I am working with companies at the moment on social media. So I'm working with Fender, which is a guitar company, and to just kind of broadening the view on disability in that space, because so often like within the music space, things aren't accessible. Um, like you get to a venue and you can't get on the stage or get into the venue to be an audience member. Um, so I really wanted to kind of work with Fender to actually have disabled people in this space and encourage more accessible um, ways of playing and having disabled people in the music space and I kind of talk a lot about that on my page I talk a lot about having disabled people in spaces where 
we may be aren't always and um some of those spaces need a lot of work so like I talk quite a lot about fashion and I think that there's a lot of things that are missing <laughs> in fashion and a lot of things that need to be worked on um but I'm under the belief that if it's going to exist it needs to exist as sustainably as possible and as inclusively as possible um so I do a lot of work around that and ensuring that disabled people are are kind of in that space and we're working with brands in that space and that it's accessible for us um, and really kind of trying to make it as inclusive as possible. Great and um, let me just interject one thing any of the links that we're putting in the chat we will be sending the chat after to participants in case it isn't accessible. Um, so yeah Dev. Yeah, um, I am working on a lot right now. Um, it's, um, but I also realize I, I forgot a part of my visual description because it's so new is I have a scraggly little goatee and mustache. Um, they are very new to my visual description from the last few months. So I keep forgetting to mention it, um, but I'm very proud of my sad little goatee. Um, but in terms of collaborations, um, right now I am working with Luminato Festival Toronto. Um, that's an arts festival in Toronto. Um, and we, I am producing and curating a, a program called Radio Lumi. It's an online radio station. And Radio Lumi is a uh, programming centered, uh, designed to center blind and low vision audiences as a way to finally provide access to Illuminato Festival programming um, for those audiences, but it also just has great content anybody can enjoy. Um, there are pre-show notes, there are audio descriptions. Um, if you just want to listen along, to some of the performances and you can't take the time to, uh, you know, be there in person or, or have it up on your screen, um, which is really great. Um, but also like interviews with the artists, um, with our blind and low vision hosts. So you get some new perspectives. Uh, they ask some amazing questions and um, we're our, we'll also be featuring some local disabled artists, uh, musicians, and some of their music on there as well, uh, and folks from Crip Collab, um, which I realize I did not give our interpreters as a name, but that's Collab is C-O-L-L-A-B, um, and that's a zine put on by a group called Sticky Mangoes, um, and that's felt as you would think uh and yeah they they uh it's a zine for uh racialized qt bipoc uh disabled artists and um i get to and i got to interview a bunch of them and they will be spotlighted on there um I am also, uh, I've also been working with Real Abilities Toronto, um, that film festival uh, as part of the curatorial team. Um, and I'm really excited about all of the, the content uh, Real Abilities is gonna put up. They launch in a couple of weeks, um, which is really exciting. I believe it's the 26th. Um, and, Oh gosh, what else am I doing? Right, today I just got to announce that I have a short film at Inside Out, uh, which is a queer film festival also here in Toronto. Um, it's a very short film, very, very short, but uh, it is both available in, for in-person screenings and virtually, which is so exciting uh, for access reasons and yeah, I could probably keep listing things off, but I'm gonna stop it there. And yeah, uh, all my social media will will give you all the details of all the other uh, um, um, enormous things that I am <laughs> just constantly taking on. End of thought. This is Sky speaking. 
Uh, I think we're all very focused on education and educating folks. I know that we all also have experienced a lot of ableism in education ourselves. So I'm interested in hearing about some of those experiences and why you decided to, um, to, to be an educator yourself. Um, and yeah, educator in the broader sense, not in like having to have a, a degree in teaching or, or something. Um, for me, I had a culture shock when going to college. Um, I had grown up in with, with a lot of disability community around me. So going to college, I kind of finally realized how rare that was and also experienced a lot of ableism with the way that the fashion department at the School of the Art Institute was set up in a way where they were highlighting the burnout culture and, and using that actually as like a brag, like they would say to high school students who are prospective SAIC students, like, oh my gosh, our, our fashion department the, is so amazing. Like our students actually take sleeping bags and will sleep in the hallways uh, while they're doing their projects. And like, just like being so obsessed with like productivity in the most unhealthy way possible. Uh, and I decided I didn't want to be a part of that. Uh, along with other experiences that I had where they were being outwardly racist, uh, having projects that were literally cultural appropriation projects uh, that they were having us do. And I yeah, didn't want to be a part of it. And I decided to start my own thing and put my clothing line up on Etsy and then just start to kind of do a lot of education around what my work uh, an ideology was. Um, so like I wrote this my manifesto, Radical Visibility, a Queer Crip Dress Reform Movement Manifesto, which is also featured in an abridged version in Disability Visibility, which Dev has also a great essay on incontinent, incontinence in it. So um, yeah, I did, that's how I kind of got into this work. Um, uh, I'll just keep on doing Eliza and then Dev just so that we can have that in our heads. <laughs> um, yeah, so for me, I experienced a lot of ableism in education um, and it was pretty much all the way through from um, primary school. Um, and so I used to have teachers like one of my head teacher described me as uh, my brain as that there was nothing there uh, to my parents, which um, was just so bad um, and they would refuse any accommodations um, I used to so I'm dyslexic and I used to go out of school to kind of meet with a tutor um, because the school weren't um, offering me enough support and I recognized I was really lucky to have um, that as an option but unfortunately the school would actually do things like not allow me to leave um, so they would like lock the door and say that I couldn't leave despite the fact that it was agreed that it was something that was going to be happening every week um or they wouldn't they used to have to come and get me and like take me down out the room but they would refuse to come and get me um they would kind of do things like make me stand up in front of class and spell things um and then moving into secondary school um I kind of in primary school is really quite a lot for being like different and um people were kind of yeah saying horrible names to me and then um in secondary school um in terms of like with students, I, I kind of didn't, fit, I wasn't being bullied, um, but with teachers, there was still a real issue with access. Um, so for a start, the school was just not accessible. So there was no lift, there was like loads of stairs um, and we didn't really ever learn about disability in school. And I also wasn't given any accommodations in secondary school either. I remember really vividly um, that my parents had to really fight for my accommodations um, in, for exams so at the time I kind of just needed things like extra time and my own room and I remember really really vividly that somebody came in on the day of the exams and they had broken their finger um, which obviously is not ideal for coming into an exam but what I found really interesting is that they were able to get them 
accommodations instantly like they literally came in on the day of the exam and basically said I can't do it um, because this has happened and they gave them accommodations instantly which is what it should be of course if somebody's hurt themselves and they need accommodations then they should be giving them straight away um, but I just remember thinking like oh I really fought for these accommodations that actually they were deliberately not giving me just for the sake of not giving them to me um, rather than it actually being an issue with funding or whatever um, and then as I kind of came into university um, this is when I kind of started bec to become more and more physically unwell and just not really coping with things um, and it was actually a time where I was unlearning my own ableism as well that I was holding um, and kind of navigating um, the community and trying to understand what was going on and um, yeah I just became really unwell and it was a, a really big time of learning for me um, and yeah to where I am now um, and with uni they were pretty supportive but I think that the whole system itself like you couldn't we couldn't do any seminars online it was all in person um, and so there were times where I wasn't well enough to come in and obviously there was no option it was you're in or you're not and you can't catch up at home or whatever so that was quite difficult as well but I guess at uni it was less um, like obvious ableism it wasn't you know the the staff weren't saying horrible things to me but it was just more the system um and I talk a lot on my page about ableism within school and um I truly believe that really the school system is built off of ableism as it's as it sounds at the moment um and it's it just there's so many things that don't work with it um and yeah at least where I am based and I'm sure in lots of other places as well Thank you, and, and Dev. Um, so in terms of my experience with education, um, I, I was born with spina bifida, uh, but because of how, like where on my spinal column that was formed, uh, my disabilities was pretty invisible for, for all of my childhood up until my young adulthood. And so um, I also experienced a lot of internalized ableism. Um, my family was very aware of, like they didn't know the term ableism, but they knew that I would experience a lot of um, discrimination and um, bad attitudes and a lot of like barriers if I was open about my disabilities. So it was often, really encouraged for me to like hide it and keep it a secret and only let people know when it was absolutely necessary. Um, and so I moved through a lot of my education that way. And it was really difficult because there were a lot of things that would have been really helpful to me. I just didn't know that I could ask for those accommodations. My parents didn't know that they could ask. And um, yeah, it was just like, it's a lot of work and a lot of knowledge that you need to have to self-advocate. And as a child of, you know, like as a second gen immigrant, that's just not something we knew how to navigate in the school system um, when, when I was a kid. And so uh, I, yeah, really hit it and tried to uh, any kind, I, as I mentioned in the essay in Disability Visibility, I had to wear those like pull-ups uh, diapers up until like fourth grade. And the only reason I ended up stopping was because I was starting to get bullied um, pretty regularly, um, even by kids younger than me. Um, it was just like this really awful time. Um, and I wasn't telling my parents what was happening. Um, I think my brother ended up finding out uh, because I would like be like, no, don't make me walk home from school alone. Like you have to be with me. And he'd be like, why? Uh, and I'd be like, um, there's this kid that's kind of mean to me that when I walk by myself, just spends the whole time picking on me. And it was this really awful situation. And it really, it like encouraged that internalized ableism and to hide things and to keep it a secret. And it really impacted my self-esteem, um, but it also impacted my ability to get like quality education. Um, so in high school, your like health classes are associated with phys ed. 
Um, and as someone who eventually one of my comments, once I did finally start asking for accommodations, it was, I can't do phys ed. Um, and when I was talking to my guidance counselor about that, they were basically just like, oh, well, phys ed is the only way you're going to get these health classes. So you're going to have to figure out another way to access those courses. And they didn't really give me any alternatives. They didn't tell me where I could find other places to get that information. Um, they were just like, by the way, you're just not getting health class then. Um, and so I didn't get sex ed in high school. I didn't learn about anything that they teach you in health class in high school. Um, and so when I went off to university, uh, I found, uh, so I went to the University of Toronto and that they have a sex ed center there that I started to volunteer at. And I started to learn all of this information about sexuality, about sexual health, that I was supposed to learn in high school and that wasn't taught in high school that should have been. Uh, and so that's how I came to terms with my like gender. That's how I, I learned about um, other folks. And it's how I also came into contact with other communities of multiply marginalized people like uh, queer, disabled, racialized folks um, who fit like within all of these intersections that I fall in who just were seeing life from a similar perspective and it was the first time that I ever really was like wow wait life can be different it doesn't have to be like miserable and painful all the time uh, it can be like caring and soft and compassionate weird um <laughs> so I ended up becoming an educator sort of by accident it would just be like I would find myself repeating the same things to people over and over again and I actually wanted to be in like fiction uh and writing like narratives and and like doing like writing films and tv shows and things like that like I didn't want to be in nonfiction. I specifically ran away from journalism in high school and I just ended up doing it again because it was like I got so tired of saying the same thing to people over and over again and it was like okay I wrote a thing I put it in a publication who verified what I am saying uh now you can just go read that uh instead of me explaining it to you um and once I started doing that I ended up getting connected to Kate Welsh uh who I mentioned earlier um who we ended up starting the Crip Collective together because um, they were looking to start doing ableism, anti-oppression trainings uh, because there was a gap in them. Uh, they, they are also queer and disabled and their employer at the time, um, they were experiencing a lot of ableism from within their employer and they, we're trying to find trainers who were already doing this work and they couldn't find anyone. This was 2018. Um, so we got connected. Um, we just like became instant friends and we were like, oh my gosh, yes, let's do this. I have so many thoughts, so many ideas. And we built Unpacking Ableism, our first workshop um, and just started to like we started doing it uh, independently, like just out of our own pocket. And then um, we started doing it for school groups uh, at universities. And then it sort of expanded from there. Now we've done them for CBC, for Deloitte, um, for regional. We literally full circle um, got to just do a facilitation for the for a regional uh, school board uh, trustees for a set of them. And so we had a chance to be like, hey, here's all the ableism I experienced in school. Here's all the ableism my friends have experienced in school and are still experiencing in school. Um, you know, like their children are experiencing in school. And, uh, you know, these are ways you can improve it. These are ways that you can actually encourage growth instead of putting in these like rigid, like as, Eliza was saying, you know, like edu the educational system is really built on ableism in its current form. And to be able to get to 
speak to people who have some decision making power in that realm, even if it's for just like a small region in in Canada is like, you know, it's such a big deal. And it's like, yeah, this is act this might actually help somebody's life, like somebody might actually have a good relationship with education because of this work. And that's just like so exciting for me. So I think I rambled enough there. Uh, so end of thought. Uh, this is Sky speaking. Um, yeah, what you were talking about earlier about saying the same thing over and over and over again. I feel like a couple of years ago, I was having like an existential crisis because I wrote my manifesto in 2015 and I just felt like I was saying the same thing over and over again. And I was like, so caught up on trying to educate people about the exact same thing for so long that I didn't have time to work on other projects that I wanted to work on or like other thoughts. And I was like, well, I have more than just the one thought that I want to talk about. Um, so I would love to hear, I, I know I didn't warn you all with this question before. So if you want to come back to it later, but is like, if you didn't have to always be basically explaining your like 101, like what would you want to uh, work on? And, and um, yeah, like what, what would you rather <laughs> get to educate people on or, or, or do um, if you didn't have to always repeat yourself. <laughs> yeah, I think um, it's um, a big, like, interesting that I just did a post actually on social media where I did a, it's a reel, and it's like, um, when a stranger comes up to you and asks like, what happened? And it's basically about how I don't have to tell people that. And, um, the amount of comments that are like, yeah, you do, you do. There's nothing wrong with being curious. People can come up to you and ask you about your medical information. Like you're a disabled person and we can see that you're disabled and you're a wheelchair user, so you should tell us. And I think that there is, you know, being curious, but I also think that there is expecting a disabled person to educate you for free outside when you're just existing doing your day um and it can be so tiring having to kind of repeat yourself all the time um and I feel like on social it can feel like you really have to keep on saying it because algorithms can play a part into it and people don't necessarily respond to things or um and things like that and I guess for me I would love to talk just a, a bit more in depth about disability and the disability experience and not be afraid of how non-disabled people will react um I get told that I'm too blunt a lot um I'm autistic so sometimes in writing it doesn't always come across um so like somebody said on a comment recently like oh is it is it okay to um come up and be curious like I'm just curious about what happened to you and I just replied and said disabled people don't exist to you know curb your curiosity on this when we're on the street I, I you know and they were really angry about this response and I'm kind of sat there thinking like I don't see anything wrong with that like that's just true I don't exist uh, imagine if you had to tell every person that you saw like your medical information like that's just not equality um and so I, I guess for me I just wish that as disabled people we could all speak and not feel scared of how people will react when we talk about our experiences because we're sort of can be grouped into like the bitter disabled person that just complains about everything um I kind of get that label a lot and that can be frustrating um because the reality is is that some days I spend my evenings crying because things aren't accessible and I can't go to a location that you know I've been invited to because it literally says on the website no wheelchair users <laughs> and it's like well you know and that's not okay and then then we I, I, online we call it like the the curse of the good crip um which is when you're like for me so my income is based off my social medias so when I kind of start to talk about things that uh, are negative that impacts my income because brands don't want to work with somebody that's talking negatively quote about their experience and so you kind of feel like you have to 
be positive, even when you're talking, like I do talk a lot about negative experiences that's happened to me, but have to be positive in, in that storytelling. Um, and that's tiring <laughs> because sometimes you do just want to be like, this really is not okay and I'm tired. Um, so I guess I just wish that we could all speak more freely um, uh, about our experiences as and when we feel we want to. And Dev. I couldn't find my mute button there for a second. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, if I didn't have to be, yeah, educating about the 101 all the time. Um, as I mentioned before, I really wanted to be in fiction work. I really just wanted, I wanted to be a novelist. I wanted to be a screenwriter. I wanted to do you know, movie productions, TV productions, my life is TV. Like I have watched Gilmore Girls five times and it's, I can tell you everything that I would have written differently about it. I could probably write a spec script on it. Um, and the only reason I haven't is I just don't have the time. I'm doing these workshops on 101 and sometimes I, go into them thinking like, oh, everybody has to know all this information by now, right? Like this is, this is common knowledge now, isn't it? Aren't we there yet? And I go in and we'll start with our introductions and just be like, hey, these are our access needs. You know, here's a, what are your access needs? And people will be like, oh my gosh, I've never thought of these questions before. And it's like, oh, wow, okay nope, this is completely necessary to, to keep repeating. And that is a little frustrating. I would love to be able to talk about the more nuanced experiences of, of my life and be able to have that be the bigger projects in my life instead of having to re like, yeah, it's always the bigger publications, the bigger organizations, they want the 101, they want the foundations, they want the basics, which is great everyone should be on the same page and have have the foundations but at some point you have to build on them and it can be so frustrating because it feels like I have to create my own opportunities to talk about those more deeper connections like um talking about my relationship to like horror and culture um is a major thing and I had to like start a whole podcast just to be able to explore that because there just like isn't room for that in this current space of oh, okay let's talk about the basics of intersectionality let's talk about you know where one identity meets another and we'll not talk about any other intersections at all um and that is just I'm getting just like a little bored of it. Um, and so it would just be great to just be able to just move forward with the conversation on a larger scale. End of thought. This is Sky speaking. I know we have a lot of questions in the Q&A, so I'll start. I'm going to do them out of order, though. Um, so we have one from Rox. What steps, if any, minimize the risk of your content being repurposed as inspiration porn? Or how do you feel uh, when your content is shared this way, whether as a creator or individual? Um, either of you. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, and I don't know if I necessarily have the answer because unfortunately, my content is reshared in many spaces that I haven't given permission for, or I'm not comfortable with it being shared. Um, so I don't know, I guess for me, I talk a lot about not being inspirational. <laughs> um, and I, I, it's, I find the word inspirational difficult because um, I get a lot of messages from people, um, also from disabled people who are kind of saying like, I really like your content it's really inspirational to me and uh, in that setting it's coming from a, a really nice and kind place but for me that word it just makes me like as I sit back in my chair I'm just like oh <laughs> what is, did I exist and surely I'm just the in inspiration for existing um so I think it's a difficult thing to 
navigate I think it's having boundaries um for things so like for me I personally don't share any medical diagnoses online as a as a safety boundary um and also I put a lot of writing over my images um so I think that kind of um stops people from taking them um and also just talking a lot about like inspiration porn and how that is uncomfortable um and so like during the Paralympics, I spoke a lot about like, I, I don't know if anybody watched it here. Um, I have mixed feelings about it. And, um, but there was a moment in the opening ceremony where somebody came up to, to speak um, and they said like, oh, I'm sure that you're all gonna be crying when you watch these athletes. Um, and you know, they're just gonna, you're gonna be so emotional looking at the things that they've been through. And I just thought like, we don't say that at the Olympics, like you're gonna cry watching rugby do they have rugby at the olympics i don't even know um and sorry you can tell i'm not very sporty but that is another thing people think that i'm a paralympian like they think that pe that they take disabled people and like plonk them on a track and i was talking to my partner about this this is a complete side note by the way but i was saying like we should get like if you put me on a track with like some wheelchair users that are racing we would see how how i'm not a i'm not a olympian in any way and how like because like we have to this is the thing we have to like explain everything we have to be like no these people are disabled and they're also athletes they're not just disabled people that we've put on a track to show disability representation these are like people that work really really hard um and like people don't even seem to understand that sometimes like and that can be really frustrating um so for me it's just talking a lot about the fact that i'm not an inspiration um also checking like people that are following me a certain like buzzwords that I put in um, to like weed people out um, and just having some boundaries in place. Um, and that's kind of the best that you can do. I don't like to say like, it just comes with the job because I think that we say that a lot to dismiss the issues that you face as a content creator, educator, um, just to being a disabled person. Um, we do say that a lot like, oh, you know, you get hate, it just comes with the job. Um, but no, it, it, you can't expect to be to get loads of hate because of your job. So it's just having those boundaries in place um, and then reporting um, as and when it happens is kind of the best thing I have for me. Um, and just constantly, yeah, calling out inspiration porn as and when I see it as well, so that people know that it is not the place, uh, <laughs> which I hope that they would, yeah, see clicking on the page, but you never know. And Dev. I feel like I have a, a slight advantage in being an unacceptable crip uh, that kind of helps with the inspiration for an angle. Um, one, being racialized kind of throws people um, and being invisibly disabled or only partially like semi-visibly disabled like when I'm using my mobility aid or if my surgery scars are visible or if you're seeing me like walk and I'm like having a bad pain day or something like that um <clears throat> it's it's not the iconic image of disability everyone has in their head so it's um because I don't fit that picture uh as well as being like trans and being very open about being trans um and my transition, uh, I think it very much weeds out all of the people who um, kind of lean in that direction. Um, and there, I mean, I obviously still get the comments uh, every now and then, but it's a little bit different in that uh, I get a lot more from people within my community who can actually speak to what about my work inspires them and not just like, wow, it's so cool that you exist and you're not ashamed of it. Um, that's an inspiration, uh, which is usually what a lot of the comments kind of boil down to. Like, I'm like so amazed that you aren't ashamed and hiding yourself and uh, keeping all of these things a secret. Um, and so I think like that does still happen. Um, but as I said, I am very much the unacceptable crip where I go online and I'm like, hey, you know what the problem is? Capitalism. 
colonialism, white supremacy, uh, you know, like TERFs, uh, you know, like, uh, and that's T-E-R-Fs uh, for folks who don't know, that's trans exclusionary radical feminists um, for folks not familiar with the term. And it's just uh, like, it, it just really does weed out all of the folks who want to just like jump in and be like, wow, you're disabled and living your life. That's amazing. Uh, Cause most of the time it's like, wait, you're living your life in a way that's unacceptable to me. Uh, <laughs> so it's not so inspiring to them. Yeah, I would argue, sorry, just to jump off, off what you just said, um, I'd argue I actually get a lot more negativity than inspiration, like people just annoyed at me being like, hey, some disabled people need plastic straws, and then people get really annoyed. Um, so I'd, I'd argue that, I think with like the core of, I mean, if you both have any ideas or want to expand on this, please do. But for me, I think the core of inspiration porn um, is that seeing a disabled person as inspiring and that's kind of it. it it's about like you know oh this person's so inspiring but that's all I want to know I don't actually want to know about the um, issues within disability or what it's like to exist or, as a disabled person um, or the fact that uh, when we talk about environmental issues we need to think about access for disabled people etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so I feel like people get much more annoyed at me because they don't find me inspiring they find that what I talk about is annoying to them because it means that they might have to do something or, or um, they might need to change a thought that they have about disabled people. Uh, I talk a lot about um, the fact that anybody could become disabled at any time and people really don't like that uh, but it's just a fact <laughs> of existing um, and so I think that they get a lot more annoyed um, which I guess is the first step of unlearning I'd like to think um, but like you know if you can recognize that emotion of like why do I feel like that and then respond and, and take time to unlearn but I find that for me unfortunately I get more negativity than inspiration porn which is still negative but in a different way um, so yeah this is Sky speaking um, yeah I uh, I get both like I'll, I'll have a lot of people saying that I'm inspiring and I think I think it's um you know inspiration is supposed to be like a an action or a verb so it's like well if I'm inspiring then like what actions are you now taking to like internalize all of these things that you're learning and then put it back out into the world to be um then <laughs> inspiring others to actually act on on things that that we need to be happening so it's like yeah not into inspiration porn but like trying to like take take those comments and then ask like what what are you actually doing now is it just you're you inspire me end of thought or is it you inspire me now i'm changing my entire life <laughs> which i have seen which is amazing like some of my the teens that I've worked with who they are just sponges and they'll just take everything that I tell them and then immediately put it into action and and, and like then get all of their fr friends in on it and they'll like come out as non-binary or trans and then they'll like talk start talking about their disabilities and and destigmatizing everything around that and like so that that part will really excite me um, and so I try to focus more on that and making sure that people are actually internalizing these things and then putting them into action. Um, uh, we have a question from uh, Rox also. Uh, As a content creator and accessibility and inclusion specialist by day, I would love to ask what you do on days that you don't want to share or educate and have a day off. Um, they said, uh, I mean, more in person than social. How do you still have positive impact and say no to questions? I struggle, especially as a visible wheelchair user. I feel I have to, I have a duty, et cetera, et cetera, basically is how um, you truly have a day off. Um, so yeah, like I, and I was interested in, in hearing about this as well. And also being like, 
yeah, how do you set these boundaries of like, <laughs> okay, this is a day off, I'm not going to do this um, and like make sure I'm taking care of myself. So yeah, either of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, Eliza. Um, okay, so <laughs> my response to this is, um, I get, so as a disabled person, I don't get to have a day off of being disabled. Um, and that is really hard. And I was talking about this in therapy actually re recently. Um, and my therapist was kind of like, you know, oh, do you find it hard doing a job that's so connected to your life? And my answer to that was, well, I don't have a choice. I have to think about these things all the time. I have to think about access. I have to think about ableism. I have to think about how people are going to receive me when I go out into the world. Um, so I don't have a choice to, to experiencing that. Um, but I do have a choice in terms of how people might respond to disabled people in the future. Um, and I think it's really important to be aware that no disabled person needs to educate. It's not your job, it's not your duty. Um, you do not exist to educate, you can choose to if you want to, um, and you should be paid for that. Um, that's really important to um, you know, ensure that we are paying people that are educating us. Um, but it's hard, it's hard when you feel tired um, and you feel that you don't wanna talk about this anymore because you're still existing in a world that, you know, doesn't receive you. <laughs> and, you know, you might go out and still get a question and, and um, it kind of can feel like tipping points for me. So like, um, I'll kind of, uh, if I have a period of really lots of inaccessible things. So for example, I was uh, booking a event on uh, Sunday last week and on, the website it said fully wheelchair accessible. So I was like, great, there are two wheelchair users going. We showed up um, and there were four, four or five people that didn't use mobility aids that were coming. And it was not fully wheelchair accessible. I had to go down an alleyway, like inside alleyway by the bins. And I was wearing a very nice dress. And I was like, this is not fully accessible. And it just made me feel really like I wasn't equal. And those are moments where you don't get to have time off and that's what's really tiring. So I think, it's a case of really looking after yourself as best you can. So if you're struggling with educating, you're feeling tired because it's, you know, related to your everyday life, booking, going out for the day, if that's something that helps you to um, kind of get some space that you know is accessible for me. I've got a garden that um, is pretty local to me and I know that it's fully accessible for me. Um, and in, those, in that space, I feel really welcomed and included. Um, so I would go to there. And also taking some time off as well. Um, it's okay to take time off however long you need. Um, and I mean, obviously there's issues with that in terms of income and stuff. Um, but if you can try to kind of take some time off and create some space for yourself, um, because it's one of those things that, you know, you can take time away from educating, but you don't get to take time away from being disabled. And that's what's, that's for me is what's really hard um, because, you know, I might just want to go about my day and then somebody might come up to me and say like, what happened or what's wrong with you or whatever. And then, well, they might say a really ableist comment, which happens sometimes as well. And then you kind of feel like inclined to, or I feel inclined to answer. So another thing that I do is I have like um, replies, like ready to go. So for example, I went to a hospital appointment with my partner the other day and I had a conversation with them and said, oh, they might ask me why I'm in a wheelchair, even though it's not relevant to the appointment in any way, but there we go. So I had a discussion with them about like, what can I say in that situation to um, have a reply like ready um, so that I don't need to feel worried and that I can kind of get that out of my toolbox and say this in that situation. Um, and that is another thing that I find really helpful. Um, and just doing things like, I guess, for, for me as a disabled person, the internet can feel um, like hot entire life. And it's such a great tool. We talk really negatively about the internet, but I think it's a really great tool. It's a really great way for disabled people to connect. Um, but it's also um, okay to put that away for a bit and realize that, you know, could you do something in, in the house? Could you do one of your hobbies? Could you spend some time in the garden? And sometimes that for me, putting that down can be really helpful and just really tapping into whatever it is, stroking my dog or whatever. Um, so yeah, those are the things that help me. Sorry, that was a bit long. <laughs> um, but yeah, those are the kind of things, the tools that help me um, because we don't get days off of being disabled and that can be really, really tiring. So yeah, totally with you on that.
Thank you. And Dev? Uh, yeah, I think Eliza really spoke to, to a lot of it. But for yeah, for me, um, it is taking breaks. It's saying to myself, I don't need to post on Instagram on the weekends. Why, why am I doing that? My weekends are for me. Um, it's being like, oh, I'm not going to check my emails after six o'clock or reply to them, even if I see them. Um, or it's having a, a support system, an emotional support network um, where I can express a lot of feelings and thoughts that are really difficult um, and really complex and, and just things that you can't really talk about in a public space um, appropriately, like give it the, the, the space and the room to actually have the real conversations um, online because everything is so shortened and, and with character limits and all of these things. And um, having spaces where I can, like having people I can call on and be like, hey, I'm really struggling with this today. And having them be like, hey, you don't have to do this. You don't need, like having those people encourage you to rest, encourage you to take breaks, encourage you to look out for what's best for you. Um, and also like, I guess to add that like little caveat is sometimes that support network, if you're not in, like uh, a privileged position like I am right now where I can be a self-sustaining artist and take breaks. Um, you know, sometimes that network looks like mutual aid. It looks like people buying you groceries and delivering them to your house. It looks like people um, helping out with bills every now and then. Uh, it looks like people uh, coming over to help with your your chores and your dishes or your laundry or whatever it is that you are struggling with. Um, I want to say like emotional support doesn't always mean like, oh, here's a shoulder to cry on. Sometimes it's like, hey, you are buried under a ton of stuff. Like, let me help you out. Um, and so if I ha didn't have that tangible support early on when in my freelancing and getting involved in the art scene um, and having people look for opportunities for me, reach out and connect me to people and, and make sure that they are helping me do that marketing work. They are helping me, you know, gas myself up and, and things like that and gassing me up for other people. Like that is so important. In, in terms of what, like being able to take those breaks. Like you do need people, this, this content creator job is actually like four jobs in one. Um, I wanna remind folks, like not only are you creating the content, you're, you're uh, marketing it, you're distributing it, you're doing all your admin, you are doing all your accounting. And it's only once you're at a self-sustaining point that you can hire people to help with those things. Um, and so if you're in a position where you can take on some of that stuff, you can help out with some of that stuff. That is the only way that we'll ever be able to survive as content creators, like disabled or not. Um, being a content creator is hard. When you add disability, like it's even more complicated. So end of thought. This is Sky speaking. I know we have 15 minutes left, uh, so. Uh, I'm going to ask another question uh, from Emily. I'm working on a queer disabled nightclub right now called Crypt the Rainbow in Brooklyn. Are there any disability nightclubs that you've heard of? Uh, and then this next question I'm very interested in. Uh, uh, what is your biggest challenge with being an online con content creator and taking that into the IRL? So like in real life, uh, they fear IRL events, being ableist and especially in time of COVID, but think fighting uh, isolation and lack of access to sex is worth the risk. Um, yeah, I, I wanna say that I've done a couple of cute disability nightclub events with the Arts of Life uh, called Rotations here in Chicago. We've done two parties um, and I have videos on my Vimeo that I can send uh, later on 
of those cute events. And we were going to try to do one um, this year at some point, uh, but yeah, needing to do events more outdoors, uh, especially for me, I, I had a very severe allergic reaction to the second vaccine. So I am unable to get a booster or any future vaccines so far um, that are created. So I, yeah, I have had to do a lot of just strict not going out and, and only really going to a couple events in the summer that are outdoors and masked. But yeah, fear it because most other events are not um, accessible. So it's like only the events that I create myself that are outdoors and then tell people that they have to wear masks because it's my event <laughs> are the only ones that I can go to. Um, yeah, I, either of you, if you, I don't know if, if y'all have any disabled nightclubs that you know of and, and then yeah, biggest challenge of being online and going IRL. <laughs> Yeah, so with disabled nightclubs, I don't have much of an answer because I'm not really a nightclub person. Um, so <laughs> I don't like the noise or the lights or the smell. Uh, <laughs> it's, just, like, it's just not accessible to me. But um, interestingly, going back to this event on Sunday, um, I actually was looking for an accessible place to go out um, and go, uh, like, because it was uh, an event for like. Uh, before a wedding um, and they wanted to like go out for a dance so I was like okay yeah fine I'll do it because I love you um, <laughs> and I couldn't find a single one in the whole of London um, that was open and accessible and that didn't say like there were so many of them were like oh we don't have an accessible toilet but we can get the bouncer to open the door for you in the office across the road and I have a lot of like um, bladder issues so I need to use the toilet a lot and I was like I'm not going to ask a bouncer to take like take me to the toilet 12 times and like that's just not access for me um so if anybody has any cool accessible nightclub things I'd love to hear about it um and in terms of taking things into real life it's definitely hard at the moment with covid um still a lot of my stuff is online um I guess it's just ensuring that things are as, as accessible as possible um doing things like lateral flows having said that um, I don't know how it is in different locations, but in the UK, we now are charging for lateral flows. So I guess that in itself is just not accessible um, and they're really quite expensive and quite hard to get access to. Um, so I have been to a few. I went to a Pride conference um, and it was really accessible. They had like quiet spaces. They had lots of accessibility consultants and they worked with a lot of disabled people to ensure that it was accessible as possible and also were kind of striving to be more accessible next time. Um, but I think it's just, I spend still quite a lot of time online, but for me, it's just whenever anybody does ask me to do something in real life, I always quite question the access needs. Um, Lucy Dawson, uh, who's a content creator online, talks a lot about the fact that she will not go to inaccessible events if the disabled community wouldn't be able to go, uh, even if it's accessible for her. Um, and I really like that idea. And um, she says that she'll be a difficult disabled person for as long as you make it difficult for me to be disabled. Um, and I really ch recommend checking out her content. She's been talking a lot about a recent event that hasn't been accessible. Um, and I think that's really important, like just ensuring that it is accessible. Um, and if it's not, kind of calling that out and ensuring that in the future, the brand's doing the best if you have energy to do so, because it's also not your job to make things accessible. Um, it is the people organizing the event. And I think that's really important because sometimes we can feel really pressured to kind of fix everything. And it's not your individual job um, to do all that work on your own. So yeah. Thank you. And Dev. Yeah, I am in a similar position in that I am not a, a nightclub person. Um, and part of that is, historically and accessibility um but also yeah I am also autistic and not a huge fan of um people being gr like up in my personal space um social distancing was probably one of the greatest things that ever happened to me having an excuse to be like hey six feet back please um has been a major 
improvement to my life. Um, but there are a couple places in Toronto um, that are trying to do more work. It is also hard to say uh, how to do things, pull from the online to IRL uh, because of COVID. Um, it's still happening. It's still existing. A lot of folks I know are just unable to do IRL right now. Um, and so that that is just something that we can't think about right now. Um, but in terms of, yeah, around here in Toronto, um, Unit 2 is an, a grassroots organization uh, made up of racialized, queer and trans um, people who, dis, who, who, who identify on various uh, areas of the disability spectrum. Um, and they, you know, like during like the spring and summer months, we'll do these like hybrid events um, since COVID started where um, they have like an outdoor party, but it's also live stream. So folks can hop in on like a Zoom stream or their like, uh, I can't remember what platform they use, um, but one of the streams, like it might've been Twitch, uh, it, you know, to be able to still be a part of those spaces. And this was something that we were trying to figure out for real abilities, um, how to create programming where we could have IRL spaces. Um, I believe we, we ended up going with virtual just because of the trajectory of COVID right now in Toronto and the continual dropping of safety precautions by government officials. And so, we weren't able to, to kind of explore all of the avenues we wanted to, but something we've been trying to figure out is how to get that hybrid event to give people on the virtual side a chance to socialize with people not on the virtual side. Uh, and we talked about, you know, maybe having like uh, booths with the live stream set up um, where people can like see the chat and be able to hop in on the chat um, or something like that, where there's breakout rooms for people who to talk about their special interests and just like get to know each other just based on what they're interested in and not just the fact that we're all disabled. Um, Cause turns out you need a little bit more uh, to a friendship than just a shared identity, uh, it, common interests <laughs> and values and things like that help. Um, and yeah, just like, uh, and there are um, bars and, and clubs and places like that, like uh, Glad Day Bookshop uh, is like, it's a bookshop by day, bookshop cafe by day, nightclub by night, uh, at least pre-pandemic times. And they have been trying to figure out how to make their place more accessible. They actually moved from an inaccessible location where you had to go up a flight of stairs to get to them. Uh, to a location where they have a bathroom on the main floor, they have um, no steps to get inside, um, and there's seating within even when on their party nights. Um, so Glad Day has been one of the few places I've actually been able to attend parties and things like that. Um, there is a whiteness problem. I will, you know, fully disclaim transparency wise uh, with Glad Day, but um, they, there's a lot of organizations and a lot of individuals who are working with them to try and improve that um, to be a more, because it's, it is one of the few accessible locations that are prioritizing. And even with the pandemic, they figured out how to live stream um, performances from their venue uh, so that everything was on Glad Day TV, you know, everyone could just pop in on that. So um, yeah, and then to echo Sky and Eliza, just when you are building those, those IRL spaces, it's prioritizing um, the most, the most, the people who need the most accommodations and the people who need the most safety precautions, you know. Um, the, the people who are the least comfortable should be the people you are creating your precautions and your 
accommodations and your accessibility around um, because they are going to be the ones who are going to have the worst time at your party and uh, no one's no one's going to recommend your party if they are not having a good time so just keep that in mind end of thought Thank you. Um, I just put in two links to the chat. One is for an event that's in less than an hour. That is one of the remote access dance parties. So if you want a disabled nightclub event right now, that's also online. So you can come in from anywhere. Uh, you, can, you can get in on that. I'm going to be showing a new video of my work there uh, with a really wild audio description where I'm speaking as fast as I can. <laughs> um, and then there's also an event tomorrow with uh, as the after party for Alice Shepard's kinetic light performance. Um, it's at 10 p.m. Central Time. And I'm also showing my work there. So um, yeah, two upcoming disabled nightclub events that are virtual. Uh, I know we have to wrap it up. So if if you all want to talk about just like some upcoming online events that we could all come to, that would be awesome. Uh, I can go first, Dev speaking. Um, so yeah, June 2nd uh, will be the screening of my film, Legacy of Bodies at Inside Out. Uh, it's at 6.45 PM EST. And well, that program will be, I will be a part of the program. Uh, it's, a, as I mentioned, both in person and online, uh, it's available. So um, can check out Inside Out Film Festival. Um, Luminato Festival is coming up in June. Um, so Radio Lumi will have all of our amazing content coming up at that point. It'll also if you head over to the Luminato website and check out our access hub, you can see archival content to see the kinds of things you can look forward to um, for our new programming and Real Abilities is coming up uh, in a couple weeks. Uh, May 26th is our launch and Oh gosh, what do I, what else do I have coming up? I'm not sure. Uh, keep following me on social media. I post everything there and I lose track of everything that I do because I have professional boundary issues, to be honest. Uh, end of thought. Um, we've got Pride coming up in London. So I'm doing lots of talks for that. Um, and I can always send some links um, over. Some of them are a bit more kind of corporate business focused which um you know we've still got to talk to corporates um <laughs> and then there's also stuff that um kind of a bit more within um disability and with other disability creators or just lgbtq plus um creators um i am starting a podcast soon um and can i get some amazing guests on um to talk about various different Things. so yeah for me social is the place to be I'll share anything that I'm doing um because I'm uh yeah you're both so organized <laughs> for me um things are kind of slowly fitting into place because my busy terms are May and May to July because disability pride in July um they'll probably be I'll probably be doing some live streams on TikTok uh with in collaboration with TikTok UK as well for that um so yeah there's various different things going on um but yeah socials is the place to to keep up to date with me uh instagram is the main place which is just disabled eliza and i think we're done so if emily wants to do this last plug for the next longmore institute event um you could jump on or i can read it uh it's okay we can send it out to folks thanks guy you can wrap it up you get final word. <laughs> oh, cool. Thank, thank you all so much. Uh, we'll send the, all of the links of all of our fun events and all of our social media to all of you. Uh, and thank you all so much for coming.